So if you're blowing up social media, I'm sorry the reception is not great in here. We're on like the bar- like the barricade mode down here in like the fourth floor downstairs. But the hashtag for this event is pound linked O C L I N K E D O C if you care, if you even know what that is. <laughs> it's hashtag linked O C L I N K E D O C linked O C. All right. Well, I'd like to officially welcome you to another Link to Orange County event. This is great. It's great to see some new faces and returning faces. I typically uh, just, uh, the question I get all the time is, what is Link to Orange County and what is it? Uh, Link to Orange County is really about connecting people. Um, You know, a long time ago, when I first started this, they said that no one would care. They said that no one would show up. They said that no one would do anything. They said that they were too busy. They said a lot of things, and they were wrong. So I thank you for continuing to to show up, to contribute. The thing I'd say about what we're doing here is I think the real opportunity is to think of this um, not like buying a ticket to the movie theater where you come and sit in a seat and the audience faces one way and you look at the show and if you didn't like it, you complain to the manager and try to get your money back. That's not what this is about. This is, this is about showing up. This is about contributing. This is about caring. This is about helping people. This is about being united with a bunch of people who have tremendous skills and talents and trying to get to know one another. Business is extremely personal, isn't it? And in order to get personal, we have to build trust. We have to uh, talk to each other, not huck business cards at each other, per se. We have to get to know each other. We have to become friends. And so this is an opportunity to come and build relationships, to make friends, the kind of friends that you want to do business with, but also the kind of friends that have got your back when things aren't going so well, right? Who will extend the hand if you've fallen down, help you back up. And so instead of viewing it more of as movie theater, I think of it more of as a laboratory where you can come and try stuff that might not work. We've tried lots of stuff that hasn't worked, and we've tried some stuff that has worked. But uh, here, it's kind of a very safe environment where we can live to tell about the story and try again. And so... As we think about it as a laboratory, as we think about doing experiments and testing out the waters, I mean, you can do that among friends, right? And that's kind of that's kind of what the vision is. I would like to introduce a man who probably needs no introduction. Seth Godin is a best-selling author. He is an icon. He is the guy who's been writing about uh, marketing and advertising, but not just that. It kind of transcends that into thought leadership. He's been doing it since forever. Um, He's got 14 plus international bestsellers. He's an incredible guy, uh, an amazing human being. And I guess I'll turn it over to Seth now, Seth Godin. Thanks. Give me a bottle of water. Give me a bottle of water. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for coming out on a Friday night. For people like me who travel too much, every day is sort of the same, and I didn't realize I was asking you to come out on a Friday night, so I appreciate that. My friend Jody came all the way. Thank you for being here. I've met many of you tonight. That was the best part. So come on in, and you're going to play with the mic a little bit so we can get rid of that squeaking sound, and now I'm going to start. We're good? Yes, I think we are. So I came with an announcement. I had to come all the way from New York to give you this announcement. And I'm going to break some people's hearts, but i got to say it anyway. Professional wrestling is fake. <laughs> now, some people knew that before they came. Some of you figured it out when you were seven, and some of you just, like, two minutes ago, that guy over there. The thing is, once you figured it out, everything about the spectacle changed for you. 
You notice the blood packs. You notice that they were holding their hand just a little bit sooner back, you know. And it changed the way you see. So all I want to talk about tonight is the way you see. And it can be a really expensive lesson. On my desk, Jody has seen this box, is a uh, little wicker box. And the contents of the box cost me approximately $40 billion. And I will tell you the story, because that is when I started to understand the importance of seeing what was in the world. In 1991 and two, I was a book packager and a freelance writer to make ends meet. And I also had access to this thing called the internet. There was no World Wide Web. So it was Archie and Veronica and other services you've probably never heard of. And I had a little connection in my office. Well, I took that knowledge of what I saw happening and I wrote a magazine cover story about what was going to be on the internet. And once I saw that there was something to write about, because I was in the book business, everything looked like a nail. I had a hammer. And I sold a book publisher a book called Best of the Net. In six months, it took six full-time people and me to write this 200-page book all about things you could find on the internet. And to help the sales force promote it, I made this T-shirt. You may recognize the logo from uh, 20 years ago. And we gave the T-shirt to the sales force to help them you know, be excited about the book. And the book went on to sell fewer than 2,000 copies. It was a total failure. During that same period of time, with the same resources I had, less, two guys in California, David and Jerry, started a company that instead of being a book about what was on the internet, was a website about what was on the internet called Yahoo. And at one point, Yahoo was worth 80 billion bucks. I figured my half was 40. There's my t-shirt. Now, the challenge of learning to see is this. A lot of the time, the world is fuzzy. And you're going to have to discipline yourself and practice until you can see the world as it truly is. Number two, you have to figure out where is the blank slate. Not what you're used to doing, but what is possible, which is a totally different way of working your way through the world. But we get hung up because instead we focus on what can we make? What are we authorized to do? What have we done before? What is our degree in? And so we ignore the blank slate and we stop seeing and we just keep doing. So from that start, what I want to do, I'll give you guys a second to come on in. Did I start too early? What did I do wrong? <laughs> this is Orange County time. Is that what happens? <laughs> I don't know if you heard, they, I don't know why they admitted this, but the guys at Grand Central Station in New York City admitted that all the trains run one minute later than they say they will, so that people won't miss the train, because everyone's like, oh, phew, I made it. No, you didn't actually make it. The whole system <laughs> is one minute late. Anyway, so one of the reasons we have so much trouble seeing is because of her. Betty Crocker, the patron saint of marketers, fictional person. We know she's fictional because she keeps changing her hair, but never gets any older. General Mills put a whole bunch of ads on in 1932, half-hour radio ads. And they made so much money from these ads, they could buy more ads. Those were so successful, they hired 250 women whose only job was signing Betty Crocker's fictional name to letters that came in. And it ended up building a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar brand, which led to the whole idea of edible mascots, right? <laughs> the whole idea of, don't eat me, eat my cousin, he tastes better than I do. That, the success of that, ads that meant nothing, that were just designed to annoy us, and you know, led to babies in ads for, I don't know, cigarettes or cola or wrapped in <laughs> saran wrap. It led to fake doctors, it led to sort of real celebrities, it led to more fake doctors, it led to unfortunate juxtapositions. All of these ads were designed to be run in a way that made a profit, because if they could just entertain you for products that I don't even know what they did, if they just did enough of this, then the people who were making the stuff would make more money. And so we all grew up if you ever start a rock band, please call it Tasteless Chill Tonic. <laughs> we all grew up with only one four-letter word surrounding us. It was the mantra of the industrialist who said, 
all I want is for the factory to go faster, to make more stuff. And I want you, the sales force and the marketers, to sell more of it, more of what we already have. And we designed our culture to make that happen. Right? We have television because they needed a place to put TV ads, not the other way around. We have magazines because they needed a place to put magazine ads, not the other way around. But when all of us were growing up, with the exception of my young photojournalist friend here today, there were only three TV channels. There were only 12 magazines. There were only two newspapers. Now, there's a billion. Right? A billion different channels you could be watching online so that marketer who wants more doesn't have a prayer. The future is not about more. The future is about ridiculous. And I'm going to spend a whole bunch of time tonight explaining what I mean by ridiculous and explaining to you why all the things we think we see, we probably need to re-see a little bit more clearly. First, a little civics question. Anyone know who this is? Yuri Gargarin, first man in space, shame on us. So Yuri Gargarin did something extraordinary. Without fancy computers, they basically wrapped a guy in aluminum foil, shot him into space, and brought him back safely. But here's the extraordinary thing. He grew up in a mud hut with no windows and no electricity. In one guy's life, in 25 years of one guy's life, he goes from living in a mud hut to going to do the most amazing technical thing in the history of mankind. And that, in a microcosm, is why we got seduced into the world we live in. Huge leaps, 1930s, 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, that the industrial age took off during our lifetime and our parents' lifetime. And it made us all rich. Everyone in this room has more resources than the king of France did when there was the last time there was a king of France. Every one of them. The guy behind most of it is Henry Ford. Henry Ford pioneered, polished, and improved the idea of productivity. And productivity is what creates wealth in an industrial economy. He went to the workers of Detroit, who at the time were making 50 cents a day, about like now. And he would go to these 50 cents a day men, and he'd say, I will pay you $5 a day to come work for me. A 10x raise in one day. How could he pull it off? Simple. He got you on the assembly line, and you did what you were told. And it was the assembly line that created value. That he was making 50 bucks a day and paying you five. And, you know, the same thing happened to Lucille Ball. The idea is <laughs> make it go faster and faster and faster. That the factory, the industrial nature of the efficient factory made us rich. And you walk around Orange County and you see us in the twilight of the industrial age and it's astonishing at how much stuff we made and how much stuff we bought. This is the River Rouge factory that Ford built. It was so big that if you started walking at one end, it would take you all day to get to the other. Henry Ford had Ford Shepherd that raised Ford sheep to make Ford wool to be woven into Ford fabric to make Ford seats because it was efficient. And so we had these huge, vast factories. And not only that, but one person or a few people at the top who made decisions and all the other worker bees who did what they were told. And that was built deep into our culture. You know why? Because we were getting rich. So it was a pretty good deal. Do what you're told, and you can have a detached garage on your house. Right? Now, in addition to interchangeable parts and mass production, Henry Ford pushed forward the idea of interchangeable people. So if Tracy doesn't show up at, on time at the supermarket, they don't shut down the supermarket. They just put someone else in her slot. And at the famous Johnson Wax building, the most notable thing is the secretarial pool. A pool, meaning if a secretary doesn't come in, they just put someone else in their slot. And we built this deep into everything we believe. Let me give you an example. If you don't mind, please raise your right hand just as high as you possibly can. Now please raise it a little higher. Hmm, what's that about? <laughs> When you were three and four and five, your parents said to you, every time you did something well, I want a little more. And when you were in school, the coaches and the teachers, every time you did something well, said, I want a little more. To prepare you for when you got to work, because you know that at work, every time the assembly line is working, they want to turn it up a little bit more. That four-letter word again, more. 
industrialism is different than capitalism. Capitalism is about individuals taking risks, things that might not work, and making a profit when they're right. Industrialists never take risks. Industrialists polish and perfect and eliminate randomness. Industrialists are willing to change the culture in order to make more profit. They're willing to, for example, Coca-Cola, transform the population into an obese one if it helps them make their stock price go up. That's their job. Sell more, more, more. That's the, wa the watchword. Here's the problem for a population that got rich. Just because you're winning the game doesn't mean it's a good game. And now the game is ending. Like it or not, the game is ending. And we are in the middle of a revolution. So I want to talk for a minute about revolutions. I don't know if you know what this is. It's a record album. And um, I show it to you because it's a symbol of how perfect the music industry was in 1973. If I had a record and I liked it, I'd play it a lot until I wore it out and have to buy another one. Or if I loaned it to Jody and I didn't have it anymore, I'd have to buy another one. And if I went to buy another one, where would I go? To the record store, which the industry didn't have to pay for. And in the store would be all these other products I could buy. And in the car on the way there, what would I do? Turn on the radio, a spectrum the industry didn't pay for, that did nothing but promote the product. And there was an oligopoly, and there was MTV, and there was Rolling Stone, and you go down the list, perfect. And we all know what happened, it only took five years. Impossible. It's impossible to imagine every record ever recorded available to anyone in the world with a smartphone anytime they want for free. But that's what we have. More music listened to more often by more people than ever before, performed by more musicians, easier to enter the marketplace than ever before. Impossible. And what happened to this industry? Happened to travel agents. It happened to make your list. It's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to your industry. That's what revolutions do. Every industry that's around is around because it's perfect, and then it's going to be replaced because something impossible is going to happen. This is not about technology. This is about the end of the industrial era because we can't make stuff any cheaper. That it used to be you could race to the bottom and along the way cut prices, commoditize stuff, make a profit. The problem with the race to the bottom, you might win. And that's no fun. And so there's going to be some disconnect. There's going to be some discomfort. <laughs> Some of you may look at this and say, I don't like where this is going. <laughs> that there's just no hope here. I don't want to hear about it. But bear with me, because I think there's really good news ahead. So I hope you don't walk out yet. What a lot of industrialists would like to tell you is that human beings like being told what to do. Like at the Monterey Aquarium when you watch the entrovies, swimming and swimming and swimming, following, 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 or the processionary caterpillar that gets in a parade and just does what it's told following things. Here's the thing. As I was talking about earlier, Grand Central Station in New York, when it gets really crowded, it's like Grand Central Station in there. And what you'll notice is <laughs> no one bumps into anyone else. Everyone is figuring out where to go on their own, and they're doing it great. That that's what human beings actually are really good at, connecting finding other people, figuring out where they want to go, and connecting. And the extraordinary thing about the connection economy is it is the next cycle after the industrial one. That Henry Ford was all about doing what you're told and doing it individually. But as Matt Ridley has pointed out, there isn't one human being on the planet who knows how to make a computer mouse. Not one. You need a metallurgist, you need a plastics guy. You need a software engineer. You need people who do supply chain management. You need hardware. All of it. We create our wealth going forward not by being individuals who are pushing cheaper stuff on each other and storage units and sales and malls. We become wealthy going forward by figuring out what it means to connect, to be trusted, to feed the network, to create benefit because we're doing it together. And the internet is the greatest connection machine ever invented. And so it's supercharging our ability to go faster and to create things of value. So what does it mean to connect? What are the foundations 
of the connection economy because it used to be the foundation of the industrial economy is build me a big factory, fill it with cheap workers. The connection economy is built on four principles. One, coordination. Notice, almost all of you were here at the same time. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. Now, value is created when we coordinate our efforts. Two, trust. If you believe that the person on the other end of the line, the person on the other end of the phone, the person across the table is on the same team as you, you are likely to do much better work. And that people you trust, whether it's the doctor who she's injecting some clear fluid into your arm, are you going to do a lab test on it before you let her inject you? Or do you trust her to do that? Without that trust, we can't build anything together. Number three, I'll take a little credit here, permission. The privilege of talking to people who want to be talked to. Not yelling to strangers, but whispering to members of the tribe. And the fourth one is the exchange of ideas. That's where the mouse came from. That the more we trust each other, the more likely it is that we're going to be able to exchange ideas and create new value where there didn't used to be any. But underlying these four things are two really surprising elements. Generosity and art. Generosity because no one wants to connect to a selfish person. No one wants to connect to someone who's just networking their way to the top. And art because no one cares about boring. That we want to connect to a human who's doing human work, maybe for the first time, who's doing it with that spirit of generosity and understanding that it might not work. That these elements are why we connect. So, what's the second most banal example I can give you? I don't know. How about smoked brisket? There's a guy in New York named Daniel Delaney who decided he wanted to start selling barbecue. Now, the old way to do it would be real estate. Get a lease, get a building, open a restaurant. Giant crap shoot. Probably not going to work. Most restaurants fail. Daniel didn't do that. What Daniel did is he went online and he started clubs of people who were interested in his brisket and he sold it a pound at a time and they came to pop-up parties, collected their two pounds of brisket and went home. And he did it five people, then ten people, then a hundred people and the word spread and people started to trust him and people started to talk about it and they admired the way he was generously sharing what he was learning and then he opened the restaurant and of course it succeeded because it was the last step, not the first step. Here's a question. What did the first person with a fax machine do with it? <laughs> so Bob Metcalf, who invented Ethernet, coined Metcalf's Law. The value of the network goes up with the square of the number of people who are using it. What the first person with a fax machine did was try to get all his friends to get a fax machine. Because then they could all use it. How is it exactly that you got on Twitter? Did you see Twitter's big Super Bowl ad three years ago? No, one of your friends got you on Twitter because the value of the network goes up the more people use it. So look at the London subway map. Where exactly would be the best place to open your little copy shop? Probably where a lot of lines meet. And here's a similar map of the internet. Who's got influence? Who matters? Now, you may think it's starting to get too late because all this track has been laid online and in connection. But the thing about connection is we always want more of it and we always want it to be better. This used to be the number one means of connection in the world. And now it's gone because we came up with a better way to do it, a way that mattered more to people. All right, so let me go sideways a little bit and talk about Joe Pine's idea from a few years ago. If it was your, where are you, birthday... There you are. If it was your birthday, I could make you a piece of cake. And if I went and bought the flour and the sugar and the eggs and everything else, it would cost 15 cents. Of course, if I was in a hurry, I could get cake mix, and it would cost me 30 cents. If I didn't like you that much and I was really in a hurry, I could buy a pre-made junkie cake, and it would cost me 40 cents <laughs> to get you one slice of cake. But some people would choose to do that. But if I really cared not just about you, but about the process, I'd go to my favorite bakery where I know and like and trust the people and they know me, and it would cost me $3 a slice to get you that piece of cake. But if you were my best bud and it was your 50th birthday, we'd go to Per Se where it's $45 for a slice of cake and worth every penny. Because we're not paying for the calories, we're paying for the experience. 
We're paying for the story. We're paying for the way it makes it feel. It's been a really long time since we bought a piece of birthday cake by the penny. Right? We buy birthday cake with our emotions because we are about to connect with someone. Now, I still got to come back to that same old brainwashing. I spoke at Juilliard, and at Juilliard, basically a factory for orchestra workers to train people to become orchestra worker, factory workers. From the time you're three, they say, go study the music. Play it as written. Play it as written. Practice, practice, recital. Play it as written. This is Beethoven's fifth. You didn't recognize it. And the thing about Beethoven's fifth is that right there in the middle on the top is that weird symbol. It's called a fermata. And fermata means play it the way you want. Not play it as written. And my friend Ben Zander, one of the most in-demand orchestra conductors in the world, he studied Beethoven for years, and when he plays it the way he wants, he doesn't sound like all those people who are doing it at recitals. He sounds differently. He's bringing a different story to it, just like that cake. And if you want Ben Zander's performance of Beethoven's Fifth, there's only one person in the world who can sell it to you, a category of one. Because it's not played as written. It's played based on what's in his head. Mike Moritz says, look, I don't want to invest in the whole flock. I want to invest in the special bird. Because it's the special bird that people are going to notice, that people are going to care about. Some of you have clients. Some of you are businesses. You want to avoid that $98 square. You say, I don't want to be the only, the only way I can grow is to be the cheapest massage studio, tattoo parlor, whatever it is. No, in fact, I'd love to be the expensive one. But no one is going to pick you if you just announce you're the expensive one. They're going to pick you if you're the different one, the better one, the one that's on the edge. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's fine, but I make something that's more boring than that. So may I suggest steel? Does anyone here make something more boring than steel sold by the ton? 30 years ago, Bethlehem Steel, U.S. Steel. That was the end of the story. So a little company comes along called Nucor. And Nucor says, we're going to make special steel, architectural steel, super expensive architectural steel for bridges like this. And you know what Bethlehem and U.S. Steel say? Fine, go ahead. We don't like those guys anyway. They're a pain in the neck. Well, bit by bit, Nucor and the other mini mills, because they had no choice, offered the customer service, the story, the experience, the birthday cake, and one by one by one, they took over every market until Bethlehem Steel and U.S. Steel, the average ones, no longer mattered. Gone. The same way when scientists take JPEGs from around the world and blend them into one picture. They don't get beauty. They get average. Then when we start averaging things up, we don't care about it so much. What we're actually looking for is the thing that's alive, the thing that's bubbling, the thing where anything might happen. There's this great Japanese term for it, which is kamiwaza. Kamiwaza means godlike, full out, the way a god might do it. So watch this video of a cheetah. Do you think that when the cheetah's running, he's saying to himself, hmm, I wonder if I'm holding my head crooked, and my left leg is really bothering me from last week. No. The cheetah is running full cheetah. There is not a lot of discussion about its cheetahness. And when my friend Amanda F. Palmer decides to release an album on Kickstarter, there's not a lot of compromise and second-guessing and how can I make everybody happy. It's full Amanda, without compromise. And when George Nakashima was carving furniture and changing the way people thought about it, he didn't say, I wonder if some people will reject this. He did it with Kamiwaza. Frank Lloyd Wright designed Falling Water in 15 minutes. Not with a lot of hesitation, but with the full spirit of knowing what he wanted. He was flying closer to the sun. And lucky for us, these guys literally flew closer to the sun, or I wouldn't have gotten here today. And when the Wright brothers were busy doing what they were doing, no one was supporting them. The mother-in-law wasn't busy sending them telegrams, keep going, guys, I'm behind you. That's not what was happening. So when we think about the story of Icarus, we have to understand that there's the new story, and then there's the real one. And the real one spent a little time talking about flying too high and obedience, but mostly it was about flying too low. It was about settling. 
Because if you fly too low, then you are in real trouble. And here we are with this extraordinary revolution at our hands, one that doesn't require owning a factory, and we are guilty of putting up funny pictures of cats. Right? <laughs> because we're afraid. Let me ask you a question. Whose risk are you supposed to play at? <laughs> I'll let you think about that one for a minute. What this requires is grit. You know, not the grit from the comic books, but the grit of a human being who says, this is the way I am going to do it. Steve Jobs was not a great programmer, nor was he a particularly good designer. Steve Jobs knew what he saw, and he knew what he wanted, and he didn't compromise that vision. That was what he added. Walt Disney was not a fabulous cartoonist, but he had the grit to be able to look the cartoonists, the animators, in the eye and say, no, that isn't going to work. It needs to be more. Not more in volume, but more in impact. And mostly, people with grit understand that their job is to fall down and skin their knee. That what they are getting compensated for is failing. Now, I don't know if any of you are afraid of flying. If you are, you should avert your eyes. This is actual sped up footage of the planes landing giant 747s landing at JFK. Now what you'll notice is they are radically and dramatically off course, near crashing until finally at the last minute they get their act together. They don't turn around and start over, <laughs> right? Built into the landing process is being wrong until you're right. And now it is cheaper than ever to be wrong. This side of the room is way quicker than this side of the room, I just got to say. So back to the marketing thing. Sea monkey marketing is what happens when the boss says, I got a whole warehouse full of brine shrimp and little packets. Figure out what you can do with it. And the marketer who thinks she's being a great marketer comes up with some great story about it and says, this is purple. No, it's not. It's scammy. Because what you're doing is building hype around something where there is no truth. But where marketing is going is someplace very different than that. The old marketing, the model of more, was interrupt a whole bunch of people. That'll get you distribution. That distribution will help you sell more stuff. And then, if you're really smart, do it again. And around and around and around you go. Buy enough ads to make enough money to buy more ads. Hand out a bunch of business cards to make enough money to hand out more business cards. Go to a trade show to make enough money to go to more trade shows, and on and on and on, right? It led to this, average products for average people, except for maybe Pop-Tarts. But <laughs> everything else was designed to appeal to the masses, to the average, because that's why it's called mass marketing, right? Average stuff for average people. But you know what happened? This happened, 30,000 items in the typical supermarket. Now, almost any product you can imagine, you can find many, 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 many replacements. So many replacements that if one of them goes away, no big deal. That the model of find some poor schmo, assault them with ads over and over again until one day they buy from you, has been replaced by people saying, I don't want to hear from you anymore. I will delete your email. I will not return your phone call. I will throw out your junk mail. And yes, I have figured out how to press the button on the remote control. So the model of Mad Men was simple. It wasn't that they slept around a lot that made them successful. <laughs> the model was they just ran a lot of ads, period. They didn't have to be good. There just had to be a lot of them. You can name easily 300 brands that were built with this model in the 1960s. You cannot name one that was built that way in the last five years. Not one. It's over. We have branded ourselves to death. <laughs> so we can... Take some time and mourn that if you want. <laughs> because many of us come from a place where that was the way things were done. It's over. <laughs> but there is good news. I promised good news. I'm only 103 slides in. There is good news. <laughs> the good news is that the old model is based on scarcity. Scarce shelf space. Scarce choice, scarce resources. The connection economy is based on abundance. Abundant choice, 
abundant number of people to connect to, abundant ways to tell your story. So the question is, if you've got something to make, something to lead, a change you want to make, are you betting on scarcity that you're going to be the only one? Or can you figure out how to reimagine what you do to base it on a world of abundance? So some of you heard this story before, but I never get tired of telling it. My wife has transportation narcolepsy, which is a fictional disease she got shortly after we got married. <laughs> and I know it's fictional because if there's a really good movie on the plane, she doesn't fall asleep. But in general, if we're traveling and she feels safe, she falls asleep. So we planned a trip to France, and we missed a flight, and we missed a connection. And for 17 hours, my wife has been asleep. And for 17 hours, my two little kids have been making a ruckus, <laughs> fighting with each other, arguing. So we're almost there. It's this beautiful, sunny day. We're driving through this pasture in France. And I notice from the back seat, it's quiet. And I look in the rearview mirror, figuring my kids are finally asleep. They're not asleep. They're staring out the window, transfixed by this perfect specimen of a cow <laughs> for about four seconds. And then they went back to making a ruckus. You know why? Because cows are boring. And if you've seen one cow, five cows, ten cows, a hundred cows, they're all the same. No one goes, oh, look, a cow. We don't need any more cows. we got plenty of cows. But what if out the window there had been a purple cow? A real, honest-to-goodness purple cow. I'll tell you what would have happened. I would have pulled over. My wife would have woken up. What's going on? She would have gotten out the camera, taken pictures of the cow. I would have gotten on the phone, called people back home, told them that I was looking at a purple cow. And my kids... My kids would have ignored me as usual, opened the door, run across the street, jumped over the fence, and rubbed the cow to make sure it was really and truly purple so that when they went to show and tell in two weeks, they could tell their friends they had seen a purple cow. A purple cow is remarkable. And what remarkable means is only one thing. I'm not in charge. You're not even in charge. All it means is someone chose to remark. And when people remark... The word spreads. The spam filters disappear. The clutter doesn't matter. Because it's not going from the marketer of sea monkeys to the, per the person who's going to buy it. It's going from person to person to person to person. So an example. A little company started 12 years ago near my house selling socks. Now the thing about socks is that you make them really cheap in China and you bring them to Bentonville, Arkansas and Walmart sells them until someone cheaper comes along. And you might make a couple hundred or a couple thousand bucks doing it. That's not what these guys do. Little Mismatch makes socks for 12-year-old girls. But not all 12-year-old girls. Only 12-year-old girls with a fashion problem. And what's their fashion problem? Their fashion problem is they don't have enough to talk about during recess because they can't wear a new outfit every day. So these 12-year-old girls show up at school and they say to their friends, Hey, want to see my socks? Watch, I can even do this. Want to see my socks? Mismatched socks. They come three to a container, not two. And the kids go home and they say to their mom, Mom, I need new socks. Last year, this company sold $40 million worth of mismatched socks. And none of you own them because you're not 12 years old. Right? So there's a whole bunch of important decisions built into that one little idea. It starts with permission. The privilege, not the right but the privilege of talking to the people who would miss you if you didn't. Anticipated personal and relevant messages to people who actually want to get them, who would complain if they didn't show up when you promised they were going to be there. That is an asset that we can build online. But it goes beyond that. Ben Graham, the famous investor, said, look, at the beginning, the stock market is a voting machine. But in the long run, it's a weighing machine. It's about impact. So the question is, is that thing you're making a momentary distraction, or is it having an impact on some people, not all? Some people, your tribe. A tribe is a group of people connected by a language, by a goal, by a movie, by a way that know each other in the world. We only used to have three, a religious tribe, a work tribe, and our local community tribe. But something fundamental has shifted. So now you've got... The Red Hat ladies in 572 cities around the world getting uppity over lunch, right? Or the Red Hat guys, the triathletes, who pay $10,000 to go to Hawaii 
They don't even like the swimming part. <laughs> so why go? They don't have roads in Orange County? No, they go because the other guys are there. They go because they are part of something. And these guys who train all year for the big day, right? They are part of something with each other. Maybe you don't want to join, but they're glad they're there. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to time you. Go. Okay, stop. Nine seconds, not so good. <laughs> One group took 27 seconds. I was sweating bullets. <laughs> but every group, no matter how diverse, has pulled it off, and every group claps at a different rhythm. Some are really fast clappers, some are slow clappers, you guys are sort of medium clappers. I made no eye contact. Brian didn't stand up and say, everyone, follow me. So how did you know at which rhythm to clap? How did you get in sync? Because we're organized to do so. We like being in sync. People like doing what other people in their tribe are doing. So your opportunity is to find your tribe and connect them to one another, create a culture for them, challenge them to go to the next level, communicate to them, commit to where they're going, and be clear about how you're doing it. If this sounds like what Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. did, it's because it is. right? If this sounds like what almost every organization that has made a difference has done, it's because it's true. Nike invented the tribe of the long-distance runners. There weren't any really, until Nike spent years nurturing it. The Beatles, on the other hand, did not invent teenagers. They just showed up to lead them. The Ro Bob Marley did not invent the Rastafarians. He just showed up to lead them. And the number of these groups is enormous and getting bigger all the time. There's a guy who has changed fundamentally the way dogs and cats in this country are treated. His name is Nathan Winograd. Nathan worked at the San Francisco SPCA and came to see that 4 million dogs and cats were killed, healthy ones, every year by animal shelters. It was their job to capture dogs and cats and kill them, usually within 24 hours. Nathan could not abide this. He started a movement. And now there are no kill shelters, shelters to kill no dogs and no healthy cats at all, all around the world, in Japan, California, He's done it city after city after city, and now he doesn't have to do it because other people are doing it. Not everyone. None of this is about everyone. Everyone is this chart. This is called the normal distribution, so-called because that box in the middle are the normal people. And what marketers came to understand is if you want to sell a lot of something, if you want to make a profit, you better have something than normal people want to buy. Better get your $100 DVD player at the cash register at Best Buy, because that's the only way you're going to make your numbers. But here's what's happened in just the last few years. The curve is melting. The curve is melting because we're connected to each other. So now, you go fly fishing with a friend, you get into it, you go, oh boy, this is great. I go to Dick's Sporting Goods, they got two fly fishing rods, expensive, cheap. You buy the expensive one, you're done. But now, if you go on flyfishing.com, there's 250 fly fishing rods to choose from. That one's no good. You've got to get the left-handed, made by monks, ultralight bamboo fishing rod. You're all the way over here. Meanwhile, you get two tattoos. You think you're really hip. But then you go to the East Village in Manhattan, and you come home, and you need 18 more. And you don't call them tattoos anymore. Now you call them ink. And then you go online, and now you need ones all over your, right? And so for everything that anyone cares about, they're moving out of the middle. The only people who are left in the middle are bored and boring and not interested about that item. Why would you ever want to sell to them? Why would they ever buy from you? All that's left are the weird people. All that's left in every market are the people who care. Look around. There's only weird people here. It's Friday night. You're here. <laughs> right? I have no interest in selling anything to a normal person because they're not interested. So back to the industrialists, the bane of our existence. They created the public school system. They created the entire system of saying, we need to train kids to follow instructions, to sit still, to do well on standardized tests, and to do what they're told. And the reason we want them to do that is so we can ignore them, so we can take the power away from them, give them the lowest paid job we can get away with, and then give them debt so they can buy more stuff and put it in a self-storage unit. 
But that cycle <laughs> is built deep into the industrial economy. So let's understand how it happened. For a million years, all we did for a living was hunt. And then, just in time, we invented farming. Only 10,000 years ago was farming invented. Only 170 years ago did we invent jobs. 170 years ago. That's it. That's the idea that you were going to go find a guy who was going to give you instructions and pay you money was alien. In 1700, in most of the world, the unemployment rate was zero. The reason is, there were no jobs. So how could you be unemployed? <laughs> and I think we're going to go back to that sooner than you do. And we're going to go back to that not because there's going to be a whole bunch of new jobs but because the work that matters is going to be something I'm calling art. Human work without an instruction manual that might not work, that's generous, that's designed to connect. Because if we connect, if we create trust, then we can create value. A hundred years ago this week, at the Armory Show in New York City, this painting caused riots. It's called Three Nudes Descending a Staircase, but you could tell by looking at it. Actually... <laughs> That's why there were riots. People hated the fact that not only was it abstract, but it had a name that didn't make any sense. But it was art, because it caused a whole bunch of people to connect over the ruckus that he made. Obviously, Pablo Picasso made art. Obviously, Jackson Pollock made art. Obviously, Joseph Boys did with felt. And yes, Bill Shakespeare with words. But it's more interesting to think about the art that Marcel Duchamp made when he put this urinal into an art exhibit. Because... It made people sit up and take notice and have a discussion. Not all people, just the weird people. (laughs) The second guy to install a urinal was a plumber. (laughs) And that's the difference between art and just doing your job. So if you go to the fancy restaurant and they make you a dish that they have never made for anyone before, and they look at you to see how you react to it, that's bordering on art. And that receptionist that you didn't replace with a voicemail system, because when she answers the phone, it changes the way people talk and feel and act, yes, she is doing a form of art. It has nothing to do with painting. This is a painting from Dauphin, China. They paint one-third of all the oil paintings in the world there. Every day, people wake up and paint as fast as they can. You can get the Mona Lisa for $29. That's not art. That's just painting. It's factory work. So, if you're a wedding photographer and you do every wedding the same way you did the last wedding, exactly to industry standards, you are not making art, even though you're using a camera, right? That something different is going on when we make art. Now, about this point in the evening, I can hear all the way up here in the back of your head the voice saying, well, this is not for you because you weren't born with the right skills to do this thing. So this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the... 1927 Solvay Conference of Physicists. You may recognize some of the people in the picture. There's Albert and Marie and some other guys. The amazing thing (laughs) about this, 17 people in this picture won the Nobel Prize in Physics. And almost all of them won it after 1927. It wasn't that being born in Austria makes you a great physicist it was that someone pointed to that person and said, you've got a shot, meet some other cool physicist. And that by establishing a baseline and and an expectation, then it was more likely to happen. You know, let's say you decided you wanted to be a great hockey player. You could do a whole bunch of research and regression analyses on what hockey players have in common. And you could come to the conclusion that the key thing is to learn to speak French. That's not going to make you a great hockey player, right? The key to being a great hockey player is growing up in Canada. (laughs) Because you are surrounded by people who say, you could be a great hockey player one day. It's not in your DNA. Vincent Van Gogh didn't have DNA that made him an oil painter. If he had lived 300 years before or 300 years after, he never would have touched paint, right? It's the choosing, the deciding, the willingness to live without a map. If you came here looking for bullet points, for instructions, for the step-by-step, I can't give it to you because art can't have a map. Once I give you a map, it's not art anymore. It's factory work. Even a fictional map isn't going to help you. But here we are in the United States where this is a real book. (laughs) 
because people are too afraid to screw up their invisible sheep. They go and they find an instruction manual. The problem is being competent isn't going to fly anymore because if I can find someone who can do work that's written down, they're going to be cheaper than you and they're not going to be living in Orange County. That the internet has shown up and said, oh, here, we're giving it away. Which is fine if you thought the video was funny, but if you're this guy, you're really angry at that. Because you say, I worked really hard to be in the expensive hugs business. How dare the free hugs people show up and undermine me? <laughs> but they're going to undermine you. They're going to show up and say, I will make that blank for free, just so you will trust me, just so we can connect, just so I can earn a portfolio, just so I can build my job. So what should you do? First rule, stop bowling. Now, the thing about bowling, he's from around here. Um, sorry. The thing about bowling is it's boring to watch because it's this ever closer Six Sigma to perfection thing. Number two, you don't want to sell undifferentiated commodities. Like, what are the water guys going to do? Make it wetter? Right? They tried this, but it didn't work. In general... <laughs> If you go to buy bottled water, you buy the close one, the cheap one. You don't pick among brands because it's all the same. They've been telling you it's all the same forever. So if you're busy saying to the world, I'm just like everyone else but a nickel cheaper, why are you surprised that you're having trouble to grow? Right? No, the real secret here is this. Kryptonite. <laughs> the reason Superman is interesting is because of the presence of kryptonite. If kryptonite didn't exist... If Superman could do anything he wanted, whenever he wanted, no one would care about Superman. Not the fictional one anyway, right? But it's this edge. As Kurt Vonnegut said, what we have to do is jump off cliffs and grow wings on our way down. And no one taught you how to do that. No one pushed you to do that when you were 6 or 10, and for sure when you were 25. But that's all we want to connect with. The Internet is saying to you, pick yourself. Oprah's off the air. Dick Clark, I'm told, is dead. Right? You've got to pick yourself. No one's going to anoint you or elect you or choose you. Here's a microphone, the Internet says. If you want to sing, sing. If you want to write, write. If you want to innovate, innovate. Now, some of you are going to go to work, and your boss is going to say, this is great. I would love to innovate. But it's really important we do it right. Failure is not an option. But if failure is not an option, then neither is success. Because all innovation is, is doing things wrong until you figure out how to do them right. As the saying goes, the guy who invented the ship also invented the shipwreck. And you can't have it both ways. You can't have the security of a factory and the freedom of an artist. That what goes with the freedom of the artist is the idea that maybe you're going to fly too high and maybe the wax is going to melt. Which brings us to the Blackberry. Now, some of you got a Blackberry a long time ago. The boss gave it to you and he said... Here, just when you're home at the soccer game and stuff like that, every once in a while, just look at it every hour just to make sure everything's okay. And then a few minutes later, you go, I wonder if everything's still okay. And the next thing you know, you've spent the whole day going like this. No one has ever done creative work on a BlackBerry. Its only function... See, they got this one. Its only function is to make this guy happy, the heckler, the voice in the back of your head that's busy saying, you know what, an alligator might eat us and we might fall off a cliff, and a shark might land on our house. A werewolf might eat us. We might, in fact, fly too close to the sun. This is the voice of the lizard brain. The lizard brain, the amygdala, it's right back here, is the same brain a fox has and a Tyrannosaurus rex has and every wild animal has. And we can put you in a CAT scan and I can show it light up. This is the voice that when you are sitting at home at 10 o'clock at night, and you can see on the caller ID, it's your boss's boss calling, you're not having this whole conversation with yourself about wondering where it could be. You instantly go into, okay, they figured out what I did wrong. <laughs> I'm going to get fired. I'm not going to get a reference. The economy's really bad. I'm never going to get another job. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to die. And it goes from <laughs> ring to I'm going to die that fast. 
because it kept us alive. The lizard brain kept us alive for all those years because if there's a saber-toothed tiger in the woods, that's exactly what you want. Steve Pressfield calls this voice the resistance. The resistance is what makes us have writer's block, which is a fictional malady. The resistance is what drives people to hide from all sorts of things. It's what drives us to change our clothes three times before a blind date. It's when later this evening I say, any questions, you won't raise your hand. And then when it's time for me to leave, you'll run up and say, I have a question. Because it's safer <laughs> to do it then, because you know you won't be in front of everybody else. Now look, the, the amygdala, the lizard brain, will help you a lot if a baseball is flying, baseball bat's flying through the stands about to break your teeth. Because you're instantly going to block. But at work, at art, at the stuff that you do that matters, it's going to turn you into a sheep. It's going to say, how do I hide? How do I go to the meeting and get someone else to take responsibility? Because that's what meetings are for, right? (laughs) And how do I do all this GTD stuff and checklist stuff all so I can postpone the difficult emotional labor of being able to go to the world and say, here, I made this. Right? That's so hard for us to say, here, I made this. What we really want is an umbrella, an umbrella to protect us. But as he understood, the rain is the entire point, right? That the rain, the ability, the kryptonite to be in the world with our art, and it might not work. That's what makes people want to connect with us. Busy is for beavers. It doesn't mean you're doing the right work. The right work requires you being vulnerable, as Brene Brown has so eloquently written. Vulnerable does not mean, here, stab me wherever you want. That's not what it is. Vulnerable says, here, I made this, and it's up to you to decide what to do about it. It's up to you to decide if it's for you or not. And if it's not for you, fine. It might be for her. Shun the non-believers, Charlie. Shun them. That the people who don't get the joke aren't weird like you're weird. And you will never connect with everyone. You will never please everyone. I was telling Brian earlier today, I have never met an author who said, yeah, I read all my one-star reviews on Amazon, and now I am much better at writing. (laughs) So I don't read mine, and my life is better as a result. So if you're going to use the Twitter sphere, Facebook sphere, whatever, to figure out how to do enough social grooming that for one moment, everyone in the world is pleased with you, then the question is, what are you going to do in the next moment? Because you'll have succeeded. You're done. That's actually never going to happen. That your goal isn't to figure out how to damp down the selfish critic who has never fought the battle you are fighting. Your job, instead, is to first wrestle with that voice in your head and then figure out what matters. Chung Young Trumper Rinpoche told this great story. He was a very important uh, Buddhist teacher. And he went to visit a monastery in Tibet with two much younger monks. And when they were about 30 feet away from uh, the monastery, they had to pass a graveyard. And chained to the graveyard was a junkyard dog. I guess it was a graveyard dog. It was pulling and barking and freaking out. And they're getting closer and closer, and they get about 20 feet away, and the chain breaks. And the dog runs at them, foaming at the mouth and barking, ready to bite. Well, the two younger guys stop being Buddhists and run like hell. And Rinpoche is there, and he said, I did the only thing I could do. I looked the dog right in the eye, and I ran right at him. (laughs) And the dog was so freaked out, it put its tail between its legs, and it ran away. And that's the only choice the artist has with the resistance. We cannot talk it away. We cannot ignore it, and we most especially cannot fight it. What we can do is make it our compass. What we can do with the resistance is make it our friend. Oh, you're here. That means I'm on to something. The more I do this, the more you don't like it. Here we go. Thanks for letting me know. And if you talk to artists of every stripe, this is exactly what they do. If you run a marathon, you're going to get tired. Everyone gets tired. The people who finish have figured out where to put the tired. And if you're going to make art, you're going to feel fear. But the people who ship their art figure out where to put the fear. 
They don't make it go away. They just figure out where to put it. And undermining all of this is the wild card of shame that people have pushed on us so often to get us to behave. We know the truth about you. We know what you did. You are finally being called out as being a fraud. How dare you stand up and say you know what you're talking about? Where is your degree? Where is your badge? You have no right to do this. And if we listen to the shame, then we're unable to be generous. We're unable to feed the network. We're unable, like the first guy with the fax machine, to share it and connect. And to do that would be a sin. There's a coffee shop in London called Proofrock, fancier than Starbucks. And they have one of those frequent buyer cards where if you get eight coffees, you get a free one. The thing about it is, it's not eight coffees from him. It's eight coffees from his eight biggest competitors. Now, do you think Mr. Proofrock called them all up on the phone and said, I'll do this for you if you'll do it for me? No. He cares more about coffee and the coffee experience than he does about beating the other guy. So he just did it. He put it in the world. A couple years ago, before he died too young, I was very lucky to be at a Levon Helm concert. The auditorium was about this big. I was right in the front row. Just before it started, I look up, and there's Donald Fagan on keyboard from Steely Dan, half of Steely Dan. You don't have to be an MBA to figure out how much money half of Steely Dan has. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, because I'm an MBA, I wonder how much money Levon Elm had to pay Donald Fagan to play this Saturday night in this little tiny theater. And I said, idiot. He didn't have to pay him anything. Because Donald Fagan understands, like the farmer at the farmer's market at the end of the day, if he doesn't play this Saturday night, with one of his heroes, he will never get this Saturday night again. And that opportunity to take your art and put it in the world, that's a totally different posture than saying, how do I escape? How do I not be noticed? That when Philippe Petit almost went to jail and spent two years of his life so he could walk a tightrope across the World Trade Center, he wasn't doing it saying, 30 years from now, I'll be able to sell copies of my book. Right? He was doing it because what other thing could he do that would matter more than that? This problem I used to have has gone away, but it's still worth the story, which is whenever I had a gig in Boston, I could either fly out of White Plains or drive. And if I flew, I would spend the whole time we were delayed thinking I should have driven. <laughs> and if I drove, I would spend the whole time wishing I had flown. Well, I take a flight one day. It takes 27 minutes to get to Boston. Big win. But I got punished on the way home. And we circled the White Plains Airport till 9.30 at night. It's fogged. We run out of gas. So we have to make an emergency landing. I don't know why they do that. An emergency landing in Albany, New York. Now, many of you have never been there. Trust me, it's a pit. <laughs> so we land in Albany at 10 o'clock at night. Pilot comes on, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be here for at least two hours. Then I think we'll be able to fly back to White Plains. Now, it's only an hour and a half drive. <laughs> so I open up my laptop. I go online. I rent the last car Avis has. Put my laptop away. Stand up. Turn to the audience. Oh, I'm sorry. Every, everyone's an audience to me. I turn to the passengers <laughs> on the plane. I say, ladies and gentlemen, I am not a psychopath. I'm wearing a tie. <laughs> my car is in White Plains, and I think yours is too. I already rented a car. It's got three empty seats. I already paid for it. Who wants a free ride? I'm driving. No one raised their hand. As far as I know, they're still in Albany. And I spent the whole drive home thinking about why that happened. Was it my tie? <laughs> then I realized what the problem was. Here's the deal. If you stay on the plane, it's United Airlines' fault and you've got a built-in way to blame it on someone else. But if you get off the plane, it's your fault. And we have brainwashed ourselves into thinking you should stay on the plane. <laughs> but no one's going to connect with you if you stay on the plane. So the last little story I want to tell you. David Rakoff, before he died last year, wrote an essay about his neuroses. He went to the movies, theater's empty, he's in the front row. Woman walks down the aisle, walks right up to where he is, and says, excuse me, is this seat taken? <laughs> right there. What? 
And then he has an existential crisis. Is this seat taken? Do you know how many people want the privilege you have, the authority you have, the trust you have, the talent you have? You don't have a job. You have a platform. You have a platform to make mistakes, to do art, to connect, to lead. You can look at this and say, this economy is toast. Or you can say, this is the greatest chance of a lifetime. That you could tomorrow take the microphone that's been given to you and make art and give gifts and connect and lead and ship and make a ruckus and, yeah, fly a lot closer to the sun. And you don't have to do it by yourself. The Hong Kong Cavaliers are all here, standing right next to you, ready step by step for you to do this thing with them, together, for them, helping them. You need to find the passion to care to overcome (laughs) the place where you're stuck. And so before I take your questions, the last thing I want to tell you, and thank you for coming out tonight, is this. If you want to see it in writing, I'll give it to you in writing. I'm not much for bullet points, but here you go. What your audience, what your tribe, what the weird people are saying to you is really clear. We need you to lead us. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let's do some questions. Brian has a magic microphone, so what we're going to do, rather than having an Orange County mini riot, is if you got a question, come on up and stand behind this thing, and we'll do it in a somewhat orderly fashion. All right, this is the resistance right now for everyone who's like thinking they're going to do it later. Please, sir, you win. Can we turn the house lights up a little bit, maybe? Check to test. Yes, it worked. (laughs) Well, first off, this is my first time wearing glasses, and it's kind of hard to see, like, close. But I feel like I have picked myself in terms of my life and what I'm trying to do. And I really enjoyed your book. And to a lot of people, I feel like it's really going to help them, inspire them to become the artists that they need to become. But I feel like I've, I'm a musician, and I became a graphic designer and a marketing guy and a booking agent and sure. a philanthropist and a, all these things because I've chosen to do my art, and now I just don't know how to take it to the next level to get my art to the next level. Right. And so I have this great idea that you're going to be putting up a slide about the music stuff, and it's going to, I have this idea that's going to revolutionize the whole music industry. In terms of, I don't like plastic. I don't like plastics. And Can we go right to the heart of it, though? Okay. No, go ahead. I'm just jumping ahead. I don't want to hear your idea, but I want to get you to let you finish your question, and then I'm going to try to respond. My question is, I have a really good idea. I feel like I, I have this, this idea to create art right. with, with the whole music, change the music industry, and I don't know what to do, how to connect with somebody. So here's the deal. Number one... Generally, people should never try to change a whole industry because it's too big a project until you've changed part of an industry and then a bigger part of an industry and then a bigger one. That a lot of times the resistance pushes us to have the magical perfect idea because we have great deniability because we don't have enough resources and don't know the right people. That more important, what, what, what artists who are producing and shipping do is they change three people, and then 10 people, and then 30 people. And then it's 300 people. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say about the picking yourself and who you know problem is you got to be very careful depending on your resources. If you raise 18 million bucks, you can go hire the biz dev people who will meet the people that can do the thing, that get you the patent and make the whole thing happen. But if you're bootstrapping it, and I have a free book on this called The Bootstrapper's Bible. Go check it out. If you're bootstrapping it, the most important thing are little victories. Not a giant cliff in the future, but little victories. My first year in business, I got 800 rejection letters in a row from book publishers around the the country. And it was because I didn't know how to talk to them in a way they knew how to hear and because I was swinging for home runs. And once I settled down and understood that I could bring singles along, I earned the right to hit doubles. And that might not be what you wanted to hear, 
But if you're asking me for the roadmap, there isn't one. What I'm saying is, I'm not, I'm not asking for the stories. roadmap. I'm not asking for the okay. roadmap. I've, I'm going to go on to the next question. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hi. Many of us have followed you for years, and it's been an evolutionary process. What's next? For me? Mm, yeah. All right. So look, on January 1st, I came out with four books. That was only 10 weeks ago. <laughs> next question. So how does uh, Kickstarter fit into your vision of the world, good or bad for art and commerce? Okay, so quick little background. Kickstarter is a uh, two things. The first thing is a concept which says, let someone who doesn't have a lot of funding go to their fans and say to the fans, if you give me funding, I will make that thing. And it was supposed to be philanthropic. It was supposed to be emotional. But humans are humans, and it's turned into a gift shop eBay kind of situation where people say, what are the prizes? What are the levels? What do I get? Is that a bargain, right? And so the people who run Kickstarter don't like that, so they keep trying to make that stop. So there are going to be other platforms like Pledge Music, which is really beautiful, and Indiegogo and others that will come. The concept itself of organizing the tribe first so that the risk is moved to where it should be, is brilliant. The execution is going to keep changing, but what almost everyone who uses Kickstarter misses is it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. My Kickstarter hit its, its goal in 90 minutes, but it didn't take 90 minutes. It took seven years, because for seven years, I was showing up, and then when I whispered with permission, it's ready, a whole bunch of people went. Too many people are building a Kickstarter thinking that's the answer, and they go yelling to the world, if I could just be on Boring Boring and just be on the Today Show, then it'll work. That's not what Kickstarter is for. It's not the future of Kickstarter. So the key comes back to, can you find the tribe that when it's time for your next project, Amanda F. Palmer style, they all show up because you've earned it. That's where I think it's going. Thank you for the question. Yes, please. Hi. Um, I work with kids, and I always think how and what I'm learning can I inspire kids with that? Are you thinking about doing something specifically for kids to inspire them? I'd really like to see that. Yeah, I would like to see you do that and send it to us. <laughs> I will. I, you know, I, I, I wrote Stop Stealing Dreams about for parents and teachers, not for the kids, but a lot of students have read it, which is great. While it's tempting for me to, to put something in front of a 7-year-old or a 12-year-old, you are way better qualified than I. And my job is to open doors, not to do all the writing. So I hope that you will. Hi, Hi. Seth. Hi. Um, I just have an observation I wanted to make. Please. That I've read your book twice now. And the second time I read through it, I kind of made some word changes. Okay. And not, not in disrespect. Please. Because one of the things you said is that by finding our passion to care is what makes the difference to get our art our, 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 our right. out there. So in your words, you say, the voice of resistance is a million years old. It understands that art is dangerous because art makes you vulnerable, because art generates criticism, because your art is not for everyone. Now, I just switched one word and changed it to love and says, the voice of resistance is a, is a million years old. It understands that love is dangerous. Because love makes you vulnerable, because love generates criticism, and because love is not for everyone. Yeah. And that's, that's what this book is for me. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. That's great. Hi. Seth, I, I first heard of you 14 years ago, I think, whenever I was first going to the book conventions and I was bringing out a book. And you were an innovator because I heard there's this guy giving away a free book. And it was like, everybody's he's giving it away, and it's online, he's giving it away. And then, of course, you ended up selling so many of the hard copies of it. Right. So I guess I just want to know, was, was that all well-planned? Were you giving <laughs> this a shot? What was the mindset sure. of generosity behind it? You yeah. Know, what was behind it? So that? the story is, uh, the book is still free. It's called Unleashing the Idea Virus. And what happened was, um, I wrote a book called Permission Marketing, after I'd been a book packager, done 100 books, but never as an author in quotation marks, permission marketing became this big success. And I said, I'm done. How am I going to top that? And there were a whole bunch of personal things that happened in my life that led me to a, a really cold, fallow period. 
And then Malcolm Gladwell sent me the tipping point nine months before it came out for a blurb. And I read it, and in the next 10 days, I wrote Unleashing the Idea Virus, because obviously I'd been thinking about it for a really long time, and I just typed the book as fast as I could. And I sent it to Malcolm. I said, because if, if I'm stealing from you, I don't want to do this book. He said, no, it's great. He wrote the foreword for me. Now, so his book's not out yet. I got my book. And my book's about, it says, ideas that spread win. And it also says, the ideas that spread the most are free to share. So I'm thinking, am I a hypocrite? What am I going to do with this? <laughs> so I went to my book publisher, and I said, I'd like to publish this book. And no one had heard of Malcolm at the time, because book, his book hadn't, so it didn't help. And I said, but here's the thing. One, you got to have it come out in eight weeks instead of a year. And two, I want to give it away for free online when you bring your evidence. And the publisher read it, and he said, we love this book. We're going to bring it out in 11 months, and you can't give it away for free. I said, I'd rather not be a hypocrite. So I decided to put it online for free. And the first day, 3,000 people downloaded it. That was my permission base. But then they started emailing it and emailing it because it was free, right? And we hit 3 million readers in about eight weeks. Now, at this point, I was done. I mean, like, I, I was off my plate. I could go do the next thing. But all these people started emailing me saying, this is great, but I'm 10 pages in. I hate reading this on the screen. So I said, I know how to make a book. So we made a book, but I was trying to make a point, not make a profit. So we charged $40 for the hardcover. This was 12 years ago when hardcovers didn't cost $40. And again, it's about making a point. If you want it, it's, you can read it for free, but the part on your bookshelf, that's the souvenir. And souvenirs are always really expensive. And we self-published it, and it went on to number five on Amazon, and it went to number four in Japan, and it was just Success. I made more money from the book I gave away than from the bestseller I had done with a real publisher. And that was a real insight for me. The other big benefit to me was that my ability to speak to audiences went through the roof because suddenly it wasn't the 40,000 people who had already read Permission Marketing. It was the 3 million people who had read this other book and talked about it. So that opened the door for a lot of thinking on my part that... I, was star I started by being generous, by saying, look, I have this idea. I just want to put it in the world and be honest with what the book is about. And what I discovered is that generosity happens to be the basis for a new economy as well. Mm. So thank you for letting me tell that story. Thank you. Mm. Howdy. Hi. I'm actually from Albany, and I agree with you. <laughs> They didn't hear the second thing you said. She said she agrees with me. I do. That okay. place is a dump. It's a shithole, and I'm happy to be living in California. So I'm a business owner. I've had it for five years. We're growing. And I'm wondering from the start of your career, the middle, and right now, what keeps you up at night? At the beginning, it was um, that I would have to become a bank teller. <laughs> that was a huge thing. That if There wasn't a lot of support, like... And I didn't do Wright Brothers style work, but there wasn't a lot of support for me either. And I was failing a lot. So it was about very carefully watching every penny so I didn't have to become a bank teller. And then about eight years ago, it was dealing with the fact that I was sure I was a fraud and that I was going to get caught. Um, and now it's very much that I'm going to waste this opportunity. And I work very hard not to do that. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. Hello, Hi. hello, Seth. Um, thank you for coming. Um, you've had a huge impact on me the last three years, so I want to thank, thank you. you for what you created. Um, the last three years have been an amazing time. Uh, one of the things I've struggled with is I felt like in a career aspect, I've really achieved all the things I have. But I guess the thing in the back of my mind is I feel like maybe my personal life has suffered. And is that the lizard brain talking to me, or is that something that you've experienced where you feel you want to... You know, I can't... We should yeah. move the microphone forward so I can yeah. get a better field reading on you. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> here's the thing about work-life balance. You know, there's just life. Work is something we do that's part of our life, but work-life balance, I have a hard time with that concept. That there's this place we go where we're not alive, and then we get to be alive. Yeah. So... I'm not sure that's the lizard brain saying you need to get that balance back. What I, I had an interesting uh, exchange with someone a couple weeks ago. I wrote a piece about um, 
The title was, I'm getting paid, so why should I try harder or something like that. And she said, well, what you're basically saying is we should give up all of our personal life. And I said, no, no. Harder doesn't mean more time. In fact, the people who are braver tend to have more free time, not less. That the people who are doing this vivid, brave work tend to not have to show up all day long stapling piles of papers because that thing they did shifted the fabric of the way people interacted with them. So I guess what I would say is if you are feeling underappreciated, it could, and I'm not saying you are, yeah. it could be because your work isn't brave enough. And if you get work that's brave enough, you may discover that you can get more of that life back into what you're doing. But again, I don't coach or consult for a reason. No, I, I have no, no idea what I'm you, talking about. You answered about. my question. Okay. You answered my question. Thank I you. appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Sir, would you like pick up the microphone and move five steps forward so I can feel like I can see you? Perfect. Thank you. That's right? great. Yeah. Cool. Uh, well, I've been immersed in your work for about six months now, and I love how each book kind of builds successively on the ideas of your body of work as a whole. Thank you. And I'm curious, like, was that a surprise to you at some point? Oh, it's just like know? a whole George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew Movie Nine when I made right. Movie One. Um, the the hypocrite thing is really important to me. So I'm not prepared to, because I'm not in the book business. I only write books when I have to, not because a publisher makes me, but because I can't get rid of the idea any other way. That, that like the idea says, you must make this a book. So it's not like I wake up in the morning and say, oh, I haven't written a book in a while. What can I sell today? Because I got a long list of those, but I've never written one of them, right? Permission Marketing Handbook, Purple Cow Volume 2, all these <laughs> dummies guides, right? So... When I'm sitting, you know, I, for every book I publish, I've probably written the first three chapters of ten. And if I'm three chapters into it and it doesn't sound like me and fit with where I believe, it goes away, right? And one of the advantages of the blog is sometimes a book shouldn't be a book. It should be six paragraphs. And then I can say, okay, I'm done with that. I don't have to write a book about it, right? And, but again, this is my personal neurosis, not something in general. Many of the authors I know, uh, you know, Tom Peters, certainly, his arc is there as well. And I respected that. And I think that that had a lot to do with my desire to, to sort of have it be coherent. But the puzzle, as far as I'm concerned, is finished. I don't say, oh, there's a book right there and I better write it. It's like someone else go write that one. Thanks. Thanks. How are we doing on time, sir? You're excellent. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Christine. I Hi, just Christine. found out about you through Brian on Twitter, that gal Kiki. Hi. Uh, just two nights ago. So I feel like I'm really late to the game, but I really am so glad I came. I sat Thank in you. my car in fear, and I don't know what my fear was because I came by myself. I don't fit in. I'm not an entrepreneur. Um, I make my living by pushing paper, but I make my life by writing. And I have a story that I'm telling. I'm in my third year um, not making any money but I finally have a publisher, a major publisher in New York, interested, and I'm freaked out. So my question is, how do you get out of your own way? Sure. Because I'm... Sure. Yeah. It's like thank finally you, happening, and I'm Thank you for out. being brave enough to share that with us. How many people here think of themselves as a writer sometimes? Okay, so I have a lot of riffs on this, so let me start. Until 60, 70 years ago, almost no one got paid to write. And the term writer's block did not show up in the literature until the 1940s. Now, some people may have had it, but clearly part of it was caused by the fact that there was the great American novel and Hemingway and all of this drama associated with it. Also, until very recently in Mankind, people wrote, but they didn't have a, quote, New York publisher. They didn't need the validation mm -hmm. of a New York publisher. We've got this thing of validation and cash having... Nothing to do with the fact that you love to write, that you have something to say. So we're entering this new era right this minute, which says that the single best way for the unpublished author to enter the world is to hit print on their Word document. And instead of printing to paper, print to PDF. And then take the PDF and email it to 25 people who trust you. And do not ask their opinion. Just say, here, read this. And if it's great, 
they will email it to 25 more people. And if it's not, you should write more. Right? And if it gets spread, and it gets spread, and it gets spread, and the next thing you know, 5,000 people have read it, you're going to have zero trouble selling your next book because you're already a best-selling author. The money has nothing to do with this. Right? So the validation thing, the critics thing, the copy editor thing, all of that stuff is the resistance. It's all there to give you a really good reason not to put your words in the world. And the sooner you put your words in the world, the more likely it is that you're going to open yourself up and your writing is going to dramatically improve. And if it doesn't, then maybe you're not organized to be a public writer and just be a private writer. But again, people are going to make money doing things that don't feel like what we made money doing 10 or 15 years ago. And part of it has to do with scarcity. Books sell for money... Because paper costs money and because there's only a limited amount of shelf space. Ebooks have no paper, there is no shelf space. So if there's no scarcity of ebooks, why is that thriller $2 more than this thriller? No reason. And so there's going to be a race to zero, which is fine because attention has value, trust has value. And once people have trust in you and pay attention to you, you will never, ever have trouble making a living. Thank you. Thank you. Howdy. Um, I guess what I'm struggling with right now is... Come closer. Oh. Um, the job that I have now, it's a good job. I'm fairly happy with it. I'm confident at it. Um, but I guess I'm struggling with, I don't know what my art is. So how, what can one do to attempt to figure out right. what their art is? Right. Okay. So this is, again, this is a resistance question. And by the way... If I call out the resistance when you're asking a question, there are two things to remember. One, that's always what's happening. And two, I'm not criticizing you. This is just the way our brains work. You're not born with your art. You can pick any art you want so that you could go tutor sixth graders in algebra. That could be your art. Or you could go do graffiti on the side of some building. That could be your art. Or you could become a volunteer fundraiser for Habitat for Humanity. That could be your art. And you could switch. So it's not like there's a thing in your brain that this is the only thing you're allowed to do. It's choosing to be an artist. Once you choose to be an artist, whatever you do is your art. And if that art isn't something that you end up being good enough at, then it's okay to choose something else. But first, it's this choice to say that what I do when I'm doing my best work is dancing with the lizard brain. Not extinguishing it, but dancing with it. And as a byproduct of that dance, making something and putting it in the world. And it might be a public dance performance, but it also might be a poem that you just read to one three-year-old. That's okay. It's the act of this connecting, and then if you decide that it's resonating with you, connect more. Right? But don't hold yourself up to the standard of you have to find your thing. This is true. My English teacher in high school wrote in my yearbook for Seth Godin, the bane of my existence. (laughs) And then she wrote, you will never amount to anything. There you go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Um, Do you have a process that you go through when making decisions about your business in terms of like target audience, marketing. I feel like I embrace the internet. Mm-hmm. I'm a wedding and portrait photographer. So you need to say hi to Dane on your way out. I, I do know him. Okay. Actually. Um, so, you know, part of my existence in that brand is promoting myself. Sure. Only the people that I want to attract, right. et cetera. But I feel like there's so many tools and exactly. things that you can use on the internet that I find myself, and that's a good thing, uh, the abundance thing that you talk about, yep. but I feel like um, I lose track of what's important yes. because I have 25 totally, five Totally ways, love this question. 25 ways to promote myself, yes. but my time is limited. Right. So how, what process can I trust yeah. where I can say, I'm going to choose these three and run with it? So, and I'm, I'm totally open to tactical questions like this, so thank you for bringing it up. Here's, you know, part of the reason I'm able to do what I'm doing now is because I have a real significant grounding in 
small business and, and the building blocks of actually making a sale. I have made millions of dollars of sales when I was running my first internet company and other things. If you don't make a sale, you can't do what you do for a living because doing it for a living implies you made a sale. So we go back a step and we say, who will you make a sale to? You're almost certainly going to make a sale to a bride. And that bride is going to be influenced by certain people. So your target market are the people who are going to influence that bride. So when Live, LifeSpring opened a hospital in Hyderabad that was more expensive than the free lousy hospital, but cheaper than the private hospital that people couldn't afford, they just showed up and they said, women will come because we're better. And they didn't. And it took a couple years for them to realize their customer is not the pregnant woman. It's the pregnant woman's mother and mother-in-law. Because if the mother and mother-in-law say, that is the hospital that my grandchild should be born in, sales made. So then you've got to figure out, OK, how many blocks away are people going to come? Where do the mother-in-law hang out? So one of the things they realized was babies have first birthdays, all of them. So if you gave birth at LifeSpring, they knew when you gave birth. And a week before your kid's first birthday, they would go to your house and tell you that you can have your birthday party for the kid with free stuff at the hospital in a special room, right? It's not, no sickness there. It's just a fun room. Who comes? Not other one-year-olds. Pregnant ladies and their mothers all come. Reinforcing that this place is OK. See what I mean? So in your case, there's lots and lots of people who are going to get married in Orange County. You don't care about 99% of them. You have to pick who you care about. Are you going to be the expensive one, the kosher one, the one that deals with funny pictures, the one that only works in black and white, the one that has been in this magazine that's read by these people? And once you decide what you want to stake your claim to, then you say, well, who is this going to reach? And how do I make myself famous to the family? Famous to that group of people. Right? Like lots of people here think I'm famous. I'm not famous. You could tell eight people you came, they will have no idea who I am. I like it like that, <laughs> right? But to you, it was worth coming. You need to be the same thing in your niche. And the way you get there, this is the most important thing I've said in answer to your question, is by making the market smaller. That's very scary. You say, wait, if I'm not counting how many people I have on Twitter and I'm not trying to make my Facebook numbers go up, how will I reach more people? You don't. You reach fewer people but matter more to them. How weird can you get? As you get weirder and weirder, those weird people will care more about you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Hi, Seth. Um, I've spent 17 years with my business partner building a business based upon the principles you talk about. We've done very well. Fabulous. Yeah. Um, and uh, I actually gave uh, Purple Cow to my board many years ago and said, this is why we're successful. This was to help them to understand. So I feel like your books have often talked to me and to the people in this audience. They've given me a lot of reinvigoration, a lot of uh, sparking of ideas. Uh, but my challenge is I have 450 people that work for me, and most of them are of the punch-the-clock level. Uh, they don't read a lot of books. Some of them really aren't even on email that much still these days. And I struggle with how to share with them the, the, you know, the, the, the ability, to the bravery for them to sure. share their art, yeah. to do it their remarkable way. Because right. that's what we espouse within our company, but it's still a struggle to get people to oh, yeah. live it on a daily basis, especially, frankly, on more of an entry level. These are up-and-comers, right? Sure. These are people who are very motivated with their careers. Yep. But the regular people, how can I reach them better? <laughs> no, you guys I, here are regular. That's a compliment. I, I, love, that. I love that question, and it's a, it's a brave question for you to ask. There are a couple of different ways to get at it. You know, the, the first thing I would say is many of those people are saying, I would like to do this, but my boss won't let me. They're busy saying you're the one who's not letting them because that's what the resistance says. Anytime you've ever said that expression, that's the resistance talking, right? Because people who have had your job have gone on to do amazing things, and the boss didn't fire them. So it's an easy excuse to have. At the same time, 
particularly middle managers, don't like it when they are held responsible for what people who work for them do when those people are told, go do something remarkable, go do something on the edge. So here's where the challenge comes in. At one point, I was never had as many people as you, but I had 70 people. And uh, I, I had took aside one of my top three guys, and I said, you know, you haven't had a major screw-up in at least four months. And he said, yeah. And I said, if you don't have one in the next two weeks, I'm going to fire you in front of everyone. <laughs> and I meant it. I meant you can't give the employee of the month parking space to the person who doesn't make a, a mistake and then say to the employees, I want you to make mistakes. You have to give the employee of the month parking space to the person who makes mistakes. That's the only way to do it. So if you are serious about this, you've got to figure out the boundaries because people think you're tricking them. And you say, you know, everyone's allowed to make a $500 mistake, but don't make a $5,000 mistake. Everyone's allowed to, be, to mistakenly be too kind to a customer. No one's allowed to mistakenly be not kind enough. So the Tony Shea model was, I am not going to measure how, long, how many calls you handle at Zappos on customer service. I'm going to measure how delighted people are. One employee stayed on the phone for seven and a half hours with one customer, right? And Tony didn't say, cut the crap. He made a big deal of how great this was. Because anyone who was willing to do it, fine with him. So that challenge is there. Is you can't say to them, be as brave as I was when I was in your shoes. What you can do as a manager slash leader is start making the size of the box of what a good job looks like bigger and make a big part of employee evaluation oh, you didn't screw up at all the last six months, you don't get a raise. Because then you're going to start seeing people, because they've been programmed to do it one way, to start playing the game, because you just encourage them to do so. Brilliant. Thanks for coming. Seth, can I, uh, can I ask, ask a quick follow-up? Yeah. We're doing, we're doing great on time, by the way. Can you also share, kind of as a secondary story, the story about the community college teacher who you met... And tell the other side, because he's obviously an amazing boss. Sure. But tell, can you tell, just tell that story on the flip side? Yeah, and she wasn't a teacher. She was actually the person who ran the whole college. I gave a talk to an uh, educational convention, and there were like 80 people who came to the Q&A afterwards. And in that talk, I had way more about how broken school is because of industry. And this woman raised her hand, and she says, Yeah, that's fine. Except I run a community college, and those people are never going to be artists. Those were her exact words. She said, those people are only able to follow instructions, if that. And I shed a few tears. I almost started sobbing. And I'm, I try to be polite when I hope you think I've been polite tonight. But I was not polite to this woman in front of the other 75 people. I said, how dare you? How dare you take the trust that these people have given you and put them in that box just because you don't like the way they look or where they went to elementary school? You have years of their life to turn them into somebody who's going to care enough to take a semester off and go to Haiti or care enough to connect with other people and make a difference or believe that they're capable of, yeah, going to medical school because they want to make the world better, right? And... So I, I wrote a blog post about it. And when I was writing it, I felt very strongly, and I knew that it would resonate with people, and it did. But what stunned me was I got more than half a dozen emails from people who were angry at me. Mm-hmm. And they were angry at me because they liked the safety that came from being seen as one of those people. Because if you're seen as one of those people, the resistance is really quite happy. The other part of your brain isn't, but the resistance has the safest place in the whole world. I would do that, but they won't let me because I think they think I'm one of those people. And so when I raised the, the bar on that, they're saying, whoa, 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 what are you calling me, a fraud? And in fact, I'm calling out the resistance and saying, you know what, as the cartoon says on the internet, no one knows your dog. If you want to write, write, and we won't know who you are until after we've read it. And that's what we're seeing. You know, Amanda F. Palmer would never have been picked by Clive Davis. She would never have been picked by Dick Clark. But she made the billboard charts, and she has fans who write on her with Magic Marker. And two million people saw her TED Talk in four days because she's got Kamiwaza and decided to embrace it. 
I'm going to take two more questions because then I'm going to pass out. Okay? So, please, go ahead. Um, so, I've been creating my art within the fitness and nutrition industry for the last, like, four years. And there sort of became a point where it started feeling less like art and creation and more like sure. life and work. Yep. So, how do you, do you just scrap it at that point? Or do you, like, what do you do at that point to bring back the art of it? Well, so, we got to think hard about who are your customers and what are you building? Jackson Pollock died before he could get in the business of selling lots and lots of silk screens, right? But Salvador Dali and Andy Warhol sold lots and lots of silk screens. That's factory work. They made the art a long time ago. This is like the souvenir edition. So it's entirely okay to run a business that profits from selling souvenir editions of art you made a while ago. So I would say the Curves franchise, never having been there, the original idea was pretty artistic, right? Let's figure out how cheap we can make this and how many we can build. And it was scary, and a lot of people didn't want to invest in it, but then it worked. But once it's up and running, it's a factory, right? Now, there's nothing wrong. We're going to need people to make clothes and pacemakers and give us the same haircut every time. But if you want to spend your whole day being an artist, that's okay, too. You better find a partner who can take the art the same way Thomas Edison could give the invention to someone, and that person would go make a million light bulbs. Right. So it's that balance. Got it. Does that Thank help? Thank you. Yeah. And you're the last one, sir. Thank you. Hi, Seth. Hi. Hi. Um, I was curious. Would you say that the industrial employment economy is really the provides all the disposable income for all the products, or at least and all the supporting professional services provides the economy for all the entrepreneurial products and services that people in this audience might be? Uh, I, I need looking. you to, to fill out for me what you mean by uh, support and professional. Well, I guess just in terms of having the disposable income for people uh, to, to sell products and services of a more creative and unique flavor. Yeah, I guess what you're saying is if we don't have people who are accountants and bricklayers, we won't be able to create enough GDP to be able to enable us to buy these other things that feel fluffier. Or to sell what we're doing. To, you know, to yeah. provide disposable right. income to so, buy. See, yeah. the thing is, only 1% of the people in America grow food. It used to be 5%, it used to be 20%, it used to be 40%. When it was 40%, you could say, this is a real economy, because we're building something people need. Now, only 1% of a population is making stuff we actually need to be alive. 99% of us have layered, 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 layered on top of that. So we're we're entering this economy, this post-industrial economy, where, yeah, we're going to have ever scarcer energy resources and ever scarcer natural resources. That's a given. But robots are going to do almost any task that you can describe that uses dexterity within 10 years. Surgery? Right? I want a robot to do my heart surgery when I need it 10 years from now because it's going to be way better than a human. Well, Make a list of all of those things that are going to get it. So these layers keep going up on top. And the question is, where do you want to be? I think it makes sense to have an organic goat cheese farm because you're at the foundation and we're always going to need something to eat. And I think it makes sense to be up here, the brave new world of I don't know what's going to happen next. It's this weird middle layer where there's going to be a lot of unhappy people because some people are going to be pushed to be the cheapest. And that's no fun. So I don't know if I answered your question but I gave it my best shot. Guys, you can stay around and mingle. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So if I could just have your attention real fast just for some closing comments. There's some people that I would really like to thank. Take your seats for just a second. Um, I would really like to thank our sponsors who helped make this happen, especially uh, Zips Customs in the back with the cool zip-up shoes, Entrepreneur Magazine, Pepperdine University, the Orange County Register, our friends at TechSpace, uh, Smart Levels Media back there, our great printers, all the student volunteers. Where are the students? Stand up. Raise your hand. Take a look around. These are your future employees. These are your future innovators. These guys are great. Thank you so much, guys. I'd also like to thank... Um, Jamie Johnson, who painted that awesome mural. Take a look at it. Take your picture. Share it on Instagram. Blow up the internet with it. It's awesome. And um, thank you all for coming. For everyone who retweeted and shared this on Facebook and really just helped tell friends. 
Really appreciate it. We do this every month. My name is Brian Elliott. This is my labor of love. And you can find all the uh, details on the event calendar at linkedoc.com. Hope you'll see us. Hope we'll see you next month. Thank you very much.